Well, I, I guess I'll start it off saying that uh, I really see like a, a few main problems with higher education's governance today. Uh, and uh, there's, uh, I would say the first thing that it's kind of almost sclerotic. It doesn't act, it doesn't react to problems. It's kind of moving very slowly in the same direction. And um, that direction has long since passed the uh, um, law of diminishing marginal returns. Um, another problem I'd say is there's a lack of independence by the boards. Um, and, and also along with that is a uh, kind of a lack of confidence by the boards. They seem to be sort of ignorant of their own roles. And um, I, one of the main underlying problems is there's a major asymmetry of information problem um, that allows the mostly the administration to exploit the boards and basically remove them from the process. Um, you want to add anything, Jim? Or? Yeah, I, I would simply note that uh, higher education is rather interesting, especially in the United States, because it makes uh, unprecedented claims. Give us lots of money, but oh, by the way, you shouldn't tell us how to spend that money. You shouldn't have much to say about our curriculum or whom we hire or nearly anything. Uh, if you think about that, in any other part of society, in any other part of the economy, if somebody asserted something like that, they would be locked out of school. But in higher education, that's the claim that is made. Uh, in my view, the farm was sold several decades, if not centuries ago, in terms of the way uh, governance developed in the United States. Uh, there are several pretty venerable doc doc doctrines like academic freedom uh, and the like that allow faculty members to do things that uh, aren't necessarily always in the best interest of society. Uh, so uh, from my point of view, uh, the uh, game is almost a fixed game. And unless we really make fundamental changes in how board members are appointed, how they are trained, what they are told they're supposed to do, uh, things are going to continue down the same track. I wouldn't argue with basically a single word there. Um, the, uh, I mean, one of the things that there, there seems to be when you go back to um, how they were able to sort of usurp the role of the board, the faculty was, um, because of academic freedom, there seems to be this uh, absolute law of, well, all decisions must be left to the experts. And that's sort of a problem. Um, experts tend to have fairly narrow net knowledge, and the decisions that have to be made about some very important things, such as who gets hired to be faculty and the curriculum, those are sort of societal level decisions. And the societal level decisions you want made by people who are more generalized and maybe have experience more in the world and haven't, you know, dived real deeply into one subject. Um, so uh, th that's one area where I would completely agree with Jim. Um, some of the other things like uh, there's a lot of rules on the books in most colleges. At most colleges, the trustees have the right to review faculty hires. Um, and they are failing to, you know, they're just completely th throwing that aside. Um, this is part of the asymmetry of info problem. When they get on the board, they are told by the administration, um, oh, that's not your role. But they should be reviewing faculty hires because some of the departments keep getting more and more extreme, and they're hiring people who are way out of the mainstream compared to regular folks. And they're just, um, it, everything just keeps moving in the same uh, radicalized or extremist direction. So, yes, the board 
definitely has to start jumping in and doing that, but we have to change the way they're trained uh, in order for them to start doing that. One of the things that I observed as a public university president for 15 years uh, is that the people who are appointed to boards oftentimes are appointed simply because they've contributed politically, not because they have particular skills or even particular interests. Although sometimes one of the reasons that they want to be on the board is that they have a particular thing in mind that they want to accomplish. For example, they're very interested in intercollegiate athletics. Uh, the typical board member, though, even those who are CEOs of Perkins 500 firms, and I had several of those on my boards over time, including people who are chairs of the board, do not really understand the complexity of a modern university. Uh, in Virginia, for example, uh, the University of Virginia nearby where I am uh, has approximately 30 private foundations, a medical school, a host of public-private partnerships, and a $4 billion budget. Uh, as a consequence, a board member comes in and they don't really understand this complexity, and they do not understand the extent to which a college president or a dean or a provost or somebody like that can hide from them the basic uh, operations of the university if that's what they choose to do. So what I'm suggesting is that in a state like Virginia where the statutes are really very general, the statutes on what board should do simply say you're in charge of this university, but don't say, for example, that you should be a fiduciary. Don't say that you should be working in the best interests of students and uh, of citizens that board members come in and they don't quite know what they're supposed to do and they're not trained and then they confront all this complexity and over a period of time they begin to depend substantially on the president and the vice presidents and other university officials for information. And quite frankly, over a period of time they get co-opted. They get themselves into a position where uh, they're highly dependent upon the university for information and they take the information they get from the university uh, as, well, this is gospel, that's the way it is. And they don't recognize that the interests of the president, of the faculty, and other people on campus may not be the same as citizens and students. Yes, um, without a doubt. Uh, I mean, uh, in the University of North Carolina system, where uh, which I'm used to, um, the... the the manipulation by the administration of the board is intense for all the reasons you've cited. Um, a lot of times, and also CEOs seem to have, there are not, higher education does not have some of the corrective um, mechanisms that the private sector does, such as pr the profit. You know, if a company's not making money, Everybody on the board recognizes there's a problem. But how do you judge that in a higher education system? It's a very, extremely difficult. So a lot of times, um, even a top-level CEO coming onto the uh, board assumes that it is his role as a um, board member to support the president and to... Um, and he doesn't have these this corrective sort of information that uh, would help him maybe look at things differently. Yeah, I would certainly uh, agree with that. And another problem I see is the notion of shared governance. Oh, yes. that faculty members should be sharing uh, governance duties with uh, the administration and with the board. And a certain amount of shared governance, I think, of course, is appropriate. But there is a fundamental principle of management, and that is that the people who uh, have uh, the uh, ability to make decisions should also be the people who bear the responsibility for those decisions. Uh, and that's one of the problems with shared governance, because faculty members can vote in the faculty senate to do X, Y, and Z and go home and uh, have a few beers. Whereas they're not really responsible for what they did. It's the administrators and the board who are responsible for what they did. So uh, the notion of shared governance, I think, has to be refined. I don't think it has to be eliminated because I think there are certain kinds of things where 
the viewpoints of faculty members and of faculty senates and the like ought to be given great respect because they are closest to the situation. But uh, it shouldn't be a circumstance where, well, the faculty senate said this, so therefore we've got to do it. I don't think that follows. Yeah, um, once again, in full agreement uh, with um, the incentive structures, I mean, you're dealing with the board is essentially does not have like intense incentives for a lot of its actions. Occasionally you get, I notice in our system, you will get somebody who who thinks that they're supposed to represent a region or a particular college, and that's a problem. But both administrators and faculty have certain incentives that aren't necessarily in the best interests of the university, um, such as uh, a faculty member may, uh, they want to do research and they want to offload some of their, um, say, administrative duties or their advising duties. And so um, to keep them happy, the administration wants to hire more staff. So that's one of the reasons why we have this uh, massive increase in staff. And um, another thing, with along with shared governance, and this is what I was talking about with the problem of the gov that uh, universities don't seem to be able to react very well, is um, there's this soft governance mechanism in the shared governance process that often gums up the works. The faculty and the administration sort of like the way things are going, and so they really don't want change. And then you throw in not just uh, faculty, administration, and the board, but you also have the accreditors and the uh, oh federal government mandates with Title IX and so forth, Title IV, um, and all of a sudden you've got this system that just, it's going to move on its own. It, and and um, I don't see a lot of capacity for reform unless you somehow make reintroduce a hierarchy with a board at the top of it. Well, certainly there are lots of forces that uh, militate against any kind of change, and we, we've mentioned several of those here. Uh, faculty members, interestingly, and this is something I've written about, a faculty member may vote for Karl Marx in the next election, but he or she in their own work is really pretty conservative. They don't want change. They don't want to consider doing things in a different way. Um, there is a model out there that uh, many supporters of current ways of doing things and higher education uh, use, and it's the uh, Beethoven symphony or uh, uh, musical group uh, simile. And what basically involves is uh, looking at a uh, string quartet that has four members, uh, two violinists, a violinist, and a celloist. And the simile says, look, if you wanted to make them more productive, would you speed them up? Well, no, that would ruin the, ruin the music. Uh, would you uh, get rid of one of the violinists or the cellist? No, that would really change the nature of the music and ruin it. Well, higher education has used some version of this simile to justify why it's basically now doing things the same way as it was uh, 100 or 200 years ago. Uh, and technologically, there is no longer quite the need for that. But I'm mentioning this because there is a strong tendency in higher education for faculty members to object to things that are different from the way they are doing things now. And again, to go back to board members, many board members are simply not well enough informed about what's happening in other institutions and or different ways of doing things that can't really argue with that. And they defer to somebody that comes in. And if somebody comes in who's uh, just pulled off a million dollar grant in physics, uh, there's a tendency not to want to argue with them about things, that they're experts, but they are not necessarily experts in the way that higher education ought to be structured and formulated. Um, certainly. Uh, the uh, Now, in a case with, uh, you know, 
a physics guy, they tend to be uh, a certain degree of expert there. I, I'm going to, you know, as far as physics goes. But yes, they, um, they lack, this is what I was talking about with you need a sort of a, a high-level societal view rather than a, um, that, that lower level. Um, and uh, I, I don't know how you're going to turn that ship. Um, now, we're talking mostly about public universities. Um, I, I see three different types of universities or colleges. You have the prestigious very prestigious private schools, and it's hard to see them being affected by market forces <clears throat> or by politics. You have less prestigious um, colleges that they are very susceptible to market forces, and they can be changed that way. Um, with uh, public universities, they're fairly... Uh, safe for market forces, but they can be influenced by politics. So it's up to, depending on how the school, the political organization, how, how it's, uh, who governs, who's on top of the trustees in a state university system, whether it's the governor or the legislature, it's up to them to kind of start to push things. I don't really see a lot of capacity for change within universities. Um, they, as he said, they're kind of they kind of like the way things are right now, and um, so there has to be some kind of change forced from outside. Um, I do see today a little bit of there is starting to be a little bit of political push. I don't know whether. Um, whether it's enough, but uh, that, that's where the hope is coming from, at least in the public sector. Okay, let me shamelessly advertise my recent book with the Johns Hopkins Press, uh, Runaway College Costs. Uh, this particular book focuses intently on the role that governing boards have had in increased college costs, which have gone, of course, uh, up very rapidly. In there, I discuss some specific things that I think ought to be done. And number one really is to change state statutes to establish clearly that the universities are fiduciaries and the board members are fiduciaries who are supposed to be acting in the best interest of the society and of students as opposed to necessarily uh, doing what the president wants or what faculty members want. Uh, so I think we need to enunciate pretty clear goals. The next step really to me is the appointment process inside states. Uh, it's very, very different. And of course, in some states like Pennsylvania and Michigan, the members of boards are elected, which uh, presents a completely different kind of circumstance. Although I might add in the book, uh, we look at the uh, tuition and fee increases of states and the boards and find a very little difference between boards that are elected and those that are appointed by governors or by legislators. But I think we need to improve the quality of people. Several states have developed blue ribbon nominating commissions that come up with the names of individuals who they think might serve well on a board. Uh, there aren't many of those states and governors in the states where those exist. I'm generally ignoring what they have to say anyway. But uh, that's one way to go about producing better names and a better list of individuals. Uh, then, of course, once they're appointed, we have to train them. In my view, if somebody doesn't want to undergo the training, which ought to be a continuous kind of thing, they can't serve. They ought not to be able to vote on the board. That's tough medicine, but I think it's appropriate. Uh, then the board, I think, has to appoint a good president, an effective president, and put the right kinds of incentives in front of that president. Uh, if the incentives you put in front of the president are bigger is better, and research grants are what count, uh, as opposed to how much it costs students to attend or uh, how much students are learning, then presidents 
and the vice president and the, and the like are going to behave accordingly. So I think it's really very important that you hire the right president and you put the right kinds of incentives in front of them because if you don't, they won't do the kinds of things you would like. I know to say, but I don't want to go on too long here. Go ahead, Jack. Um, yeah, the idea of electing, um, of having public elections is intriguing. There aren't many states doing it. I know in Colorado they've been doing it. Um, but that is an intriguing idea. It might wind up being the same as a school board election where, you know, the turnout, so they do it at an off time, and if the turnout's so low that the uh, local chapter of the Education Association or the PTA controls the whole thing. But it is an intriguing idea. The one, one element that's missing in all this is the role of the alumni. Um, I think that alumni have a capacity to influence the schools in ways that they are not been doing. Today you get uh, the alumni are your basic mushrooms that are, uh, you know, kept in the dark and fed uh, nonsense and they get their shiny uh, uh, alumni uh, magazine that tells them how wonderful everything is. And um, at some schools, they are actually make a few schools. Um, they're actually starting to make a difference. One that I know that Jim has even written about, uh, or at least talked about, is uh, Washington and Lee. They, um, they got kind of upset about a few things like uh, changing, getting rid of Robert E. Lee from the school name and uh, so forth, and taking down some statues. And one tiny little alumni group uh, went from maybe uh, 10 friends to now a uh, group with about, you know, I don't know, nine or 10,000 people who can really put pressure on the board. And um, the board just changed this. <laughs> there was a situation where they changed the statute, and some of the board members are like, Wow, we've never done that before. So um, I think the alumni are uh, maybe a key to if they can be made independent from the administration, because um, once again, the administrations are able to manipulate them pretty good, but they could be a key influence towards restoring some sanity. I, I agree with that, uh, but I would also say my experience as a president and I did spend 15 years as a college president, and then I've evaluated as a consultant about 50 different presidents. My experience with alumni is oftentimes they are the easiest people for the president to co-opt. Uh, they are sometimes almost uncritical supporters of the university. So the alumni situations I know of where they've made major differences are predominantly in the private sector and not in the public sector in terms of alumni making a difference. Uh, but uh, I am certainly interested in having individuals who know something about the institution. That generally uh, is a recipe for greater effectiveness quicker. But uh, again, my experience with some of the alumni is that they are single issue people. They come on and they have certain something they want in mind. It might be Division One football or not Division One football or something like that. And they uh, are sort of uninterested in uh, the rest of the uh, agenda. Uh, but ultimately, I, mean, I think my major interest has been in terms of controlling the uh, increase in college costs. And there are just all kinds of things there that boards could do to change what has been going on. Uh, we uh, in Virginia looked at uh, tuition and fee increases, cost increases in Virginia, and found that boards voted almost 99% in favor unanimously of any tuition and fee increase put in front of them. Uh, now, there may have been a few that were withdrawn ahead of time, but when it actually comes to a vote, uh, no votes are few and far between. Uh, and that, I, th I think, is an indication of how much influence administrators end up having over individual board members. Um, yeah, the, uh, now, but there have, I, I think alumni situations are all individual. 
it depends on the school. A school like Washington and Lee has some special categories. Special categories. Um, one uh, state, um, one of the things that I, I was talking with somebody about, and they came up, if you want alumni to uh, have an influence, you have to look at a state where you have, um, where there's the biggest mismatch between the, the people in the surrounding community and the, uh, and the university itself. Um, or, or at least, uh, you know, if it's a state university system in the state, the difference between the people in the state and the university, um, something, a situation like uh, Boise State in uh, Boise, Idaho, is an extreme, has, has made some very radical moves in recent years, and um, Idaho is one of the most conservative states in the country. So that might be a state where the alumni might be more influential. Um, uh, I, Virginia's kind of, uh, I, I might not quite fit that. It maybe did at one time, but, uh, so, so, and, and whereas, uh, we had, we saw, um, Washington and Lee, the alumni had a, managed to, uh, come up with, uh, they got quite a bit of traction and at Davidson College in North Carolina, um, it didn't happen. They did not have the same sort of uh, traditions as Washington and Lee. They had very different traditions. So um, it's all very individual. It depends on the individual situation in that case. Let's uh, contrast a state like Virginia, uh, where each university has its own board, and the board has total power over that institution, and there is no higher board that can tell it no in terms of tuition and fee increases. Let's contrast that with like North Carolina or Illinois or California or New York, where there are boards above the individual boards that have the power to alter or reject. Uh, the work that we did in my recent book, the Hopkins book, shows that tuition and fee increases are more moderate. They're smaller in the states that have that higher board where there is some degree of inspection. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is that uh, it is more difficult for an individual campus to co-op a statewide board. You might co-op your own board and do things that uh, really put them in your pocket. And I'm speaking as a former president here. Who knows a little bit about this, I think. Uh, it's easier to do that with your own board than it is a statewide board who's spread all over the state and they have different interests and they're listening to different institutions. They get somewhat jaded when they hear presentations from a president who's trying to show them. So uh, we found pretty strong evidence that uh, having that statewide board moderates cost increases. And so uh, in Virginia, for example, I would like to see the state uh, uh, commission for higher education uh, have amplified powers of review and decision in order to uh, make uh, College more uh, accessible. Yeah, there's a lot of reasons why I think I also agree this, that having a statewide board introduces some uh, some good, better dynamics. Um, for one thing, you get a broader range of you know you can get a, a generally broader range of people. You're not sticking to alumni of one school, um, and they're also very. They tend to be very much. It's a, more of a political position. They tend to be very much in the political eye. They make the news more. Um, their uh, decisions are watched by the state media. And so they tend to be a little bit less, uh, a little bit more attuned. To, they have their ear to the ground of the public a little bit more, I would say. Yeah. I think one of the things that uh, the public ought to be aware of and board members ought to be more aware of is that a good president of an effective administration orchestrates board meetings. Um, the administration, the president, then will set up the topics, uh, decide who the visitors will be into the board meeting, the order in which these things occur, and uh, the best of all worlds for most presidents is a 
board meeting that goes through rather rapidly and there are unanimous votes and maybe a lot of things are considered at once and one vote is taken on all of them. So uh, I think people have to be aware of that. Uh, in particular, it is important that board members hear from people other than the individuals the administration would like them to hear from. Uh, I have again evaluated lots of presidents and I've never been in a board meeting where they brought in, let's say, a woman, uh, let's say an unmarried woman with two or three children who's struggling to pay for college. I never heard that kind of person talk to the board about how difficult it was for them to pay for college and the role of student debt and things of that sort. Rather, presidents do the same thing I did when Oldham University recorded his first Rhodes Scholar. Obviously, that person came in to talk to the board and had lunch with the board and spent lots of time with them. And that was a, a truly nice circumstance, a good occasion. But the point is, board members have to ask for more than that. They have to be willing to ask uh, for other kinds of voices. They have to be willing to ask critical questions. And I say this, they have to do this in a, a somewhat friendly uh, fashion. They ought not to be overly aggressive and antagonistic, but they have to be willing to read materials and then say, gee, I need to know more about X. Could you produce a data set that would speak to this particular situation? Can you have us talk to so-and-so? Our next meeting, would you bring in this individual? Uh, board members then have to be more active than most are. Uh, most board members, uh, I'm sorry to say, end up being spoon-fed. Well, this, this is something that I've been suggesting for a long time is that uh, boards have their own sort of staff members um, who are beholden only to them. Um, it, you'll find in most colleges, the, uh, it's the administration who sets the agenda. They, um, they um, bring in the outside experts to talk to them about subjects and so on. And um, with a, uh, if the board had like an expert level or a, a policy level employee who actually did those things for, you know, um, I mean, it's an, the amount of money is minimal to hire somebody like that to the amount that they would eventually save because they would be getting an independent voice rather than um, uh, supporting whatever the administration or the faculty wants. Um, that's a that's been a that's a, and we actually in North Carolina we got that put in the law that the board should have one, but unfortunately at the last minute got watered down to they could have one and they haven't exercised that. So. Um, but anyway, that's that's one of the things that uh, that's one thing that I think would greatly improve board governance. 